Hello guys, hope you're all doing fine today. Quick video here about this Shelton Supernova. I don't know how many of you know anything about it. Supernova 1987A. So let's listen to what this lady has to say first. 30 years ago, on February 24, 1987, observers in the Southern Hemisphere noticed a new object in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Today, we know this object as Supernova 1987A, and it was one of the brightest supernovas seen in hundreds of years. Okay, now please, I want you to watch this video. I have added subtitles because the video is originally in Portuguese. This video was made over 30 years ago. So please watch and look at the images and read the subtitles and understand what's going on here. Um balão de pesquisas espaciais, um tipo de satélite, caiu bem no centro da cidade em cima de uma casa. O balão foi lançado no dia 13 de fevereiro na Austrália, num convênio Brasil-Estados Unidos, NASA e Instituto de Pesquisas Espaciais. O balão tinha por objetivo estudar a estrela supernova de Shelton. A queda do balão estava prevista para o Brasil e durante todo o tempo ele foi observado pelos engenheiros, técnicos e pesquisadores da NASA. Este equipamento pesa quase duas toneladas. Ele estava a uma altura de 50 mil metros da superfície quando começou a cair e a uma velocidade de 15 km por hora. O destino era uma região rural aqui de Mojimirim, mas por causa das fortes correntezas, ele acabou caindo no centro da cidade. Na queda, o equipamento e paraquedas acabou caindo sobre estas casas, mas os maiores prejudicados foram os moradores da rua Padre José 353. O equipamento quebrou o telhado, a tubulação e afetou parte da estrutura. 15 minutos depois da queda, os engenheiros e técnicos da NASA já estavam no local. O corpo de bombeiros e a polícia foram acionados. O acidente acabou atraindo muitos curiosos que não dispensaram nem o binóculos. Quem viu o balão caindo ainda estava apavorado. Como é que oh, caiu esse balão? Eu estava fazendo almoço, né? Estava na cruz, ai, puto, arrepiada. E daqui a pouquinho eu vi aquilo como joga uma bomba, porque quando eu tinha 16 anos eu vi o avião vermelho em bombardear aqui no Gine, né? E eu fiquei gritando, eu falei, minha Nossa Senhora, e como dizem que aqui é meio fraco o telhado, eu falei, ah, meu Deus, o telhado está caindo. Aquele barulho, uma... parecia que veio uma bomba. Você levou um susto? Assustei, aí eu corri para baixo, que tá cheio de gente. Só que fosse o fim do mundo? Nossa! Para retirar o equipamento do telhado, foi preciso desmontar peça por peça. A primeira caixa foi esta, que contém todas as imagens e informações sobre a estrela supernova. Depois, foi preciso o auxílio de um guincho. O que, que acontece com todo esse equipamento, inclusive com a casa onde ele caiu? Bom, o equipamento será enviado para os responsáveis, né, que é a equipe da Universidade de San Diego, nos Estados Unidos, e os prejuízos serão totalmente pagos. Esse balão de experiência foi solto pela Universidade de San Diego, na Califórnia, com orientação da NASA, para estudar o comportamento da estrela supernova. Ele saiu da Austrália dia 13 de fevereiro e a previsão era permanecer no espaço de 6 a 7 dias. Pelos estudos, certamente, ele iria cair por aqui. Mas ninguém imaginava que ia cair justamente em cima de uma casa. Técnicos do Instituto de Pesquisas Espaciais de São José dos Campos e do governo norte-americano, que acompanhavam tudo de um avião, ainda tentaram desviar o balão do centro da cidade. Nós acompanhávamos com finalidade de, de acionar a carga para aquela dele, para que ele caísse numa área limpa, né? Mas ele, devido à corrente de, de vento, veio cair aqui em cima. O satélite de 150 mil dólares, ou 15 milhões de cruzados, enviou durante os 12 dias que esteve no ar informações para a Universidade da Califórnia. Hoje, a preocupação dos técnicos era como a fita onde estão guardados todos os dados da pesquisa. Os dados estão perfeitos, a, a fita está perfeita e acredito que tudo vai dar certo. Durante toda a tarde, 20 homens do Corpo de Bombeiros e do Tiro de Guerra de Mojimirim, com a supervisão dos técnicos, trabalharam na remoção do satélite. Nem o dono da casa atingida pôde entrar nela para avaliar os prejuízos. A pessoa vai pedir indenização? Ah, sem dúvida, né? Porque eu vou procurar ser ressarcido dessa despesa, né? Porque do susto não dá. É, do susto não, não é possível, né? So this balloon was supposed to be studying the supernova, which is at an immense distance. Just listen to this person. The supernova is located in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a small companion galaxy to our own, only about 170,000 light years from Earth. Only about 170,000 light years from Earth. Okay, so this supernova is supposed to be uh, almost 2,000 light years away, and they are saying that they're sending a balloon 50 kilometers 
up, about 80 miles up, we'll be able to study something that is over 1,500,000 light years away. Just imagine like a lady trying to study what's on top of the tallest building in the world, just putting on a high heels. Okay, this is this balloon at only 50 kilometers up or about 80 miles up, is supposed to be studying a star that's over 1500,000 light years away. So, of course, this thing is not in outer space. The stars, the moon, and the sun is all between 100 and probably 150 miles up in the sky, in the dome, in the firmament, not thousands of light years away. Now, the most interesting part of this that I found is this thing here. Listen to this. In this image, called by Hubble telescope, you can see the inner ring surrounding the innermost expelled material. In this, In this image, image, called, called by, by Hubble, Hubble telescope, telescope, a primeira caixa foi esta que contém todas as imagens e informações sobre a estrela supernova. In this image, called by Hubble telescope, o balão tinha por objetivo estudar a estrela supernova de Shelton. In this image, called by Hubble telescope, o balão tinha por objetivo estudar a estrela supernova de Shelton. In this image, called by Hubble telescope, o balão tinha por objetivo estudar a estrela supernova de Shelton. A primeira caixa foi esta que contém todas as imagens e informações sobre a estrela supernova. Alright guys, so it's clear that neither Hubble is in space, there's nothing in space, there are no satellites in space studying any of these things. Everything is right here, guys, between 50 kilometers to 100 kilometers, okay? Between 80 miles to probably 150 miles, there's nothing going anything beyond this. There are no satellites in space. Uh, those balloons are being running since the 1950s. That's what's going on. There's no space. There's nothing out there. So it's the only thing NASA has always ever sent to space is your imagination. So I'm going to show here again what this guy was saying when he, when he supposedly went to space. Individuals can have a part in every stage of the process. John Grunsfeld, former NASA Associate Administrator and astronaut, worked on scientific balloon payloads while earning his PhD. The first time I saw a balloon launch, you know, helium was in the bubble, it was on the spool, the spool opened up, and I heard the rustle of the polyethylene and saw it rising and then the balloon took off and off it went. Uh, I thought, this is just the coolest thing ever. I went on. Uh, to do three Hubble Space Telescope servicing missions. And for that, it was much more like scientific ballooning. Because there, there was a moment where I was inside of the Hubble Space Telescope, this time in a space suit, you know, working with tools, reaching inside of the Hubble, and I had a flashback right to that moment on the flight line, reaching into my balloon gondola. And the thought that I had at the time was, you know, all of those lessons that I learned in, in building the payloads, preparing them for flight, was preparing me to go service and upgrade the Hubble Space Telescope. That I had at the time was, you know, all of those lessons that I learned in, in building the payloads, preparing them for flight, was preparing me to go service and upgrade the whole space telescope. So guys, just wrap the around your mind that space is fake. If you still believe in all this NASA nonsense, there's nothing that we can do for you. Earth is flat, there's a firmament, all those scientists are fools because they are trying to make you believe what's not real. They are taking money from the people and building spaceships, rockets that go nowhere. What if I told you that we have now spent $46 billion of your taxes on a project to study deep space? Okay, you would either say, hey, that's great, Sanchez. I want to know more about deep space. Or you might say, I could give a hoot about deep space. All right, keep the money here where we need it for our kids, our schools and our roads. 
What you definitely should say is, okay, what we get for that $46 billion? Good question. Because that's the question we asked ourselves here when we were having our editorial meeting this morning. And Michelle Greenstein's been assigned the distinction of finding out for us. Okay, what'd you find out? All right, so here's the situation. For yeah. the past 15 years, NASA has been working on building this heavy lift vehicle that will take us to the moon and then on to Mars. And also on building the infrastructure between the Earth the moon and Mars. Now, this is a beautiful, beautiful goal, right? Sure. It truly is. But according to aero, aerospace analyst Laura Forzik, who just put out a research paper that includes data from fiscal year 2019's budget, we've been spending about $4 billion mm. annually on this program, and we're not really seeing the return. So I reached out to her. Let's see what she had to say about this. Oh, cool. The main purpose of the big NASA heavy lift vehicle program for the human space exploration is to give us as a country a big goal to go towards. So her take is that the real purpose of these programs, these space exploration programs, are symbolic, right? They give us a sense of national pride, they unite the country, um, uh, like she said, like around this big giant goal. So we've spent, according to her research, $14 billion on the space launch system, $16 billion on the Orion capsule, which is what NASA says will take us to the moon, and then on to Mars. What do we have to show for it? Well, the Orion capsule did launch a few years ago, but without a crew, and mm -hmm. this was a private launch, and the space launch system has yet to take flight. So in terms of crewed flights, we're probably not going to see this for a number of years in the future, and by that time, you know, we'll have spent, well, firstly, we'll have spent 20 years on this program, but also close to $60 billion on this project that we seem to have already done in 1968. So I asked Laura Forzik about this. Let's see what she had to say. Hmm. You can't really say that what NASA is trying to do now is already done in the 60s because the technology is different and the mission behind it, although similar, is different. So the Saturn V rocket was fantastic for its time, but it was limited. There's just an argument as to how much money should be spent on one way versus the other or on one project versus the other. It seems like what she's suggesting is that NASA and these grandiose projects are being used for political posturing. Right. Let me stand in front of the American people and say, oh, I'm going to get us, you know, a la JFK to the moon or I'm going right. to do this and that. But in the end, it doesn't accomplish. Anything. Right. And every president kind of makes an announcement like that. And she would actually agree with you. She was quoted in Ars Technica yesterday saying that these are political projects, not practical ones. That's an interesting point. Hey, good stuff. Good reporting. Thank you. OK, I'm going to finish this with this guy talking a little bit more about all this insanity about space, making all this money and the people believe them. I have a good day, guys. See you later. Bye-bye. Next, William Burroughs, author of This New Ocean, the story of the first space age. It's a book on the history of space exploration, from ancient myths to German V-2 rockets to the space shuttle. Has. And the book that's being featured today is This New Ocean, the story of the first space age. And we're doing this program at the National Archives, of course, because we do have records relating to space exploration here, whether it's photographic records or whether it would be the legislative records, the Senate appropriations for space exploration and, and so forth. So that's why we are doing this series here. And of course, this is taking place during the week that Senator Glenn is up in space in the space shuttle. William Burroughs has reported on aviation and space for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the Richmond Times Dispatch. He's also had articles in the New York Times Magazine Foreign Affairs, The Sciences, and other publications. He's the author of seven previous books, including Deep Black, the award-winning classic work on spying from space. Mr. Burroughs is a professor of journalism at New York University and the founder and director of its graduate science and environmental reporting program. Would you please welcome William Burroughs. <laughs> thank, thank you, Judy. Uh, and thank everybody for um, being here. I really appreciate it very much. Um, one of the things um, that uh, runs through the entire history of the space age and, and, and before the space age, and this is one of the light motifs that also run through the book, is the direct relation between science and science fiction. Uh, you're not at this too long when you don't come to understand that it's the science fiction people, the SF people, as one of my friends uh, calls them, 
who laid the blueprint uh, for the people who actually built the rockets and planned out the programs. Uh, and I did a fair amount of thinking about that uh, throughout the entire process. Um, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who was the great Russian rocketeer and the father of rocketry and who we never heard about during the Cold War for reasons that will not mystify you, uh, Tsiolkovsky and Hermann Olbers, the German, uh, the father of rocketry there, and our own uh, Goddard, Robert Goddard, uh, all read Jules Verne. They all read from the Earth to the Moon, and they all had, if you'll pardon the expression, had their fires lit uh, by that wonderful voyage. They all read H.G. Uh, Wells, uh, The War of the Worlds, and so on. Um, these people were energized and captivated by science fiction. Uh, I started the book off, in fact, uh, going back to Daedalus, because I had to come to I had to come to grips with why exactly do we do this. Uh, there are cynical answers, uh, and they're relevant. Uh, one is that corporations in aerospace want to make a lot of money. Another is a lot of generals on both sides wanted to get the high ground for a supposed advantage, whatever that meant, and we're still not sure we know. But beneath that, um, there were the dreamers, there were the sci-fi people, there were the people who wanted to go for what reason? This is what I had to try to come to grips with, and when I went back to Daedalus, when I went back to Greek mythology, it occurred to me that one of the reasons is transcendence. I came to realize in the course of researching the book that what I was dealing with was not hard no in, in reality, was not hard-nosed businessmen uh, who were trying to keep their stocks up and generals who were trying to one-up the enemy. What I was dealing with was members of a religion. And that's exactly what this undertaking is. What else to call people, I'm talking about serious engineers who design colonies on Mars and interstellar missions that they know they will never live to see. What else to call them but members of a religion as people in the Middle Ages started to build cathedrals they knew they would never see finished. And what is the trait that has propelled this all of these years? That's what I got into, um, and the rest of it is the top of the proverbial uh, iceberg. Uh, I was going to say thank you very much. I mean, that's as a science journalist, um, my question is, through your career and your writing and your acting, you've inspired so many people to enter the sciences. How do you balance science with science fiction? They're both the same. Uh, a a, a uh, astrophysicist looking out there is thinking in terms of science fiction. The, the mystery of science fiction is what I'm talking about. Science and science fiction are essentially the same. Thank you very much. Last question. You know, before I, I answer any more questions, there's something I wanted to say. I, I, having received all your letters over the years, and, and, and I've spoken to many of you, and some of you have traveled, you know, hundreds of miles uh, to be here, I'd just like to say, get a life, will you, people? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I mean for, for crying out loud, it's, it's just a TV show. <laughs> I mean, look at you. Look at the way you're dressed. You, 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 you've turned an enjoyable little job that I did as a lark for a few uh, years into a colossal waste of time. I mean, I mean, how old are you people? What have you done with yourselves? In regards to the computer, we were, we were chatting about this. Um, uh, on the actual Apollo... Uh, the, the landing module, the, the whole process. How powerful a computer did you have? How, in today's terminology, how, how powerful would you say it was? Well, it was not as good as a laptop, but it was probably a little better than a handheld. It, it actually had, uh, I mean, some of you that are com computer nerds. Uh, He's a well, pilot. He's not a nerd. You know, you've you, you, you got to have gigs and uh, that kind of stuff. And we didn't have gigs or even megs. <laughs> Our, the the, uh, the uh, Apollo computer had 32K of fixed memory and 2K of erasable. That's, that was it. No screen, no sound, 
no icons, no, no nothing. Just it, and the, the keyboard just had uh, I, it had zero through ten, read, clear, and enter. I think it might have been one or two more keys. <laughs> we, we had no no graphics, no screen, no. Uh, on its best days, it couldn't get to one megahertz. <laughs> so it was slow and weak, but it got its there. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Hey, Matt. Yeah. <laughs>